<laughs> Hi everyone, and welcome to this week's Wildlife Wednesday Weekly Roundup. I'm your host, Tenley Thompson, and we've got some great videos to show you from all over the greater Yellowstone ecosystem this week. The way this is going to work is our guides have been out and about shooting video throughout Grand Teton, Yellowstone, and the National Elk Refuge. We're going to show you some of the latest wildlife footage from Jackson Hole, then you'll have a chance to win our trivia question of the week for a gift card, and lastly, I'll be answering your questions live. So, if you've got a question for a wildlife biologist that's biology or nature related, definitely go ahead and put those in the comments section. Maddie, our other naturalist, is going to be in the comments section moderating, so make sure you say hi to Maddie and do let us know where you're watching from. Let's start with one of my favorites, river otters. Let's check in to see more. Hello, it's Josh from Ecotour Adventures, and today we're going to learn about some cool adaptations of one of my favorite animals in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, river otters. A big thanks to guides Laura Kraszewski and Kelsey Wellington for getting this great spotting scope footage during one of our winter wildlife tours. Winter is a great time to look for otters who are members of the Mustelidae or weasel family. These social animals primarily eat fish but will also hunt amphibians, crayfish, freshwater mussels, or even small mammals and some birds. With a streamlined body and webbed feet, otters are quite agile in the water and can swim at nearly eight miles an hour. Otters often target bottom-dwelling fish, such as suckers, who are easier to sneak up on. But in these small beaver ponds, we've been watching them chase down brook trout. Though otters often hunt alone, in some areas they work as a team, driving fish towards each other or the shoreline where they are easier to catch. With winter temperatures in Grand Teton, Yellowstone often dipping well below zero and waterways approaching freezing temperatures, you might be wondering, how do otters handle the cold? The secret is in their incredibly thick fur. One square inch of otter fur can have as many as 160,000 hairs, so dense it becomes a waterproof barrier to their skin. That's a lot of hair, but the world record for thickest coat goes to sea otters, who may have a million hairs per square inch. With such a luxurious coat, otters must spend a lot of time grooming and rolling in the snow. This cleans and dries out their fur, allowing it to fluff up and trap air, which provides the insulation they need to keep warm. Scientists believe that social grooming also helps facilitate bonds within a group of otters. Another behavior we often see otters do is scent mark. Notice how the otters in this video climb up on top of a latrine, a rock which they will reuse over and over and deposit scat while doing a little dance. Otters may even pile up debris or rocks to more prominently elevate their scat. In addition to leaving scat behind, otters will stamp their feet, depositing scent from glands near their ankles. Latrines serve as message boards, helping social otters reunite when apart or non-social otters avoid each other. During the mating season, otters will also use latrines to find a partner. With their streamlined bodies, webbed feet, and insulating waterproof coats, otters are perfectly adapted to life in the winter wonderland of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. Please let us know if you have any questions about otters in the comments. This is Josh Metten from Ecotour Adventures. Thanks for watching. How cool is that? So a big thanks to Kelsey, as well as Laura and Josh for letting us tune in. We've had a great week with river otters, lots of sightings for you, and hopefully a little bit more for you next week. Next, let's check in with Kirk, who had an interesting experience with three moose. Hey everybody. Today we had a chance to check out a couple of bull moose, or rather three bull moose. Uh, the two at first, seem to be some of the the bigger bulls in the valley with these giant antlers and the third moose at first glance looked like a female but it's actually a male who's dropped his antlers and we can tell this because he's got these pedicles these points on his forehead that are circular and kind of scabbed over where his antlers were once connected to his forehead 
And these antlers, they start growing in the spring and they're developing throughout the summer. They're encased in this skin casing that's really vascular and it's delivering nutrients, the bone building recipe. And as it eventually completes its growth, those bones will harden up and they'll work to shed that skin casing off, maybe rubbing it on trees. Then they can really use those antlers for what they're meant for, which is locking up with each other, impressing females, trying to establish themselves as a, a desirable bull. But now that the mating season is coming to a close here in December, we're seeing that those antlers are no longer needed and those bull moose will look to drop those burdens because they may weigh up to 30 pounds. You know, if you don't need to have them around, why waste the energy carrying them? I think this bull moose is in luck. He doesn't have to carry these antlers around. These other two bull moose will soon be dropping their antlers as well. Thanks, Kirk. All right. That's pretty awesome. Moose are out and about. It's the easiest time of year to see them. But I thought it'd be fun to look back on our summer of wolves and forward into our wolf breeding season with Laura. So let's check in with her. Hey everybody, this is Laura. It's early December or early winter out here in Western Wyoming. And as you can see, there's a nice blanket of snow covering the grass in my backyard. And I'm starting to get really excited about the upcoming winter season. I'm a skier. I love it. I love to be out there in the snow. <laughs> Up at Jacksonville Mountain Resort, on average, we receive about 450 to 500 inches of snow per year. That's a lot. Uh, I think that's great, but for wildlife, that presents some challenges. As the snow gets deeper up on the mountain where I love to go ski it, grazing animals who need grass to survive will migrate from high elevation down to the valley floor at lower elevation to survive the winter. Down at lower elevation, we get a lot less snow and grass is a lot more available for animals like elk and bison to eat. So with the movements of those prey species, come predators too. Our top predator here in the winter is the gray wolf who travel down to the valleys also to prey on elk. And this time of the year can be a, a, a great time for wolves to hunt because you know elk, especially bull elk, are weak from last fall. The mating season was hard on them. A lot of the bull elk are worn out. They were sparring with each other getting into battles. They could be injured from those sparring matches. Also, you know, during the, the mating season, they might not eat as much as they, they should. And a bull might lose up to about 20% of his body weight in September and October. That's right before a migration, which could be up to 100 miles. And, and then of course, winter time conditions where forage is not as available for them. So gray wolves might have an easier time picking them off this time of the year. You know, also the, the prey, the elk, are a lot more concentrated down in the valley. They're a lot easier to locate for those wolf packs. And I feel like this time of the year, the wolf packs are starting to prepare for next spring. They want to establish the best territory with the greatest number of elk so that next spring, when it comes to give birth to the, their pups of the year, they'll be set up for success. Mating season for the wolves is in the winter. It's coming soon in January and February. <laughs> for me, that's a really exciting time of the year to look for wolves. Wolves are traveling a lot more often. Um, they're consuming a lot of meat. They're trying to keep their body condition in good shape so that they can successfully mate. And then a female wolf might be able, be able to give birth to a litter of say like three to five pups next spring. Also, if a wolf or pack of wolves has to consume more calories, 20% more, that means doing more dangerous hunting. Wolves, of course, hunt with their teeth not with projectile weapons like human hunters might. 
So they have to get really close to their prey, which may be dangerous. Elk, for example, have really sharp hooves. They do fight back. Um, also, bull elk could still have their antlers into the winter season, which might help them defend themselves. So for a wolf to have to hunt that much more, it's a great challenge. It's not easy. And there's always a chance that a wolf might not survive the, the day or the week. He could get killed by his own food. I can't imagine getting killed by my own cheeseburger. I'm up on the mountain where there's plenty of snow. Underneath my feet, there's gotta be three to four feet worth of snow packed on top of the grass from last summer. Last summer, this would have been great habitat for elk, but now elk have continued down onto the valley floor to spend their winter where grass is a lot more available and there's less snow. One disease or skin parasite that can afflict wolves over the winter is called mange. Mange is a tiny mite that gets into a wolf's coat and makes him feel itchy. So he'll want to go try to scrape it off, maybe on a tree or nearby rock, which leads to pulling out some of that nice fur, which helps to keep him warm. So if he loses enough fur and can't thermoregulate, that could lead to you know, death by freezing or changes in behavior. A wolf with mange might be less apt to hunt at night or travel at night. He also might avoid dawn and dusk hours because it's colder and travel only during the day. That could lead to not getting enough calories. Um, it's been proven that a wolf with mange requires about 20% more calories than a wolf without mange and additional elk or additional feed that uh, Oh, that wolf might require. <laughs> so larger packs with more pack members to help with hunting for elk or moose or bison or deer may be able to sustain themselves longer through a mange outbreak than a smaller pack or an individual wolf trying to do it all on its own. <laughs> um, up in Northern Yellowstone National Park this past fall, we saw some pack members in the Junction Butte Pack scratching more often. They were kind of scratching at the backs of their necks, using, using their claws, trying to get rid of a potential skin mite. Hopefully they'll be able to overcome the parasite. They have a lot of pack members, of course, 34 this year with the pups that were born last spring. So hopefully they'll be able to kick that out and do just fine leading up into their mating season. Wolf gestation period is very short, just 63 days from the time that they mate to the time that they give birth to the pups. So very similar to our domestic dogs. And yeah, this time of the year, they're, they're just trying to prepare for that next season. Well, thank you for watching. It's a glorious day out here in Jackson Hole. Hope to see you again soon. Bye. Hey everyone, it's Tyler again. So this week while giving a tour in Grand Teton National Park, my guests and I were watching some bison and we noticed a coyote near them. And uh, this coyote was actually hunting a prey item and we were able to get this on film for you. While giving a recent tour in Grand Teton National Park, my guests and I stopped to view a herd of about 200 bison. While we were observing the herd, we noticed a group of three coyotes interacting. At one point they were howling, and then one of what I believe is a younger individual 
actually started hunting for small rodents out in the grassland. And at one point, it actually catches and begins to play with what I believe is a montane vole. Now, watching a carnivore play with its prey can be a really difficult thing to watch, but it actually serves a really important function for the young carnivore. It really helps them develop their motor skills and their ability to catch prey later on. Uh, plus, it's, plus, of course, it's fun for the coyote. And what amazes me is that the vole is very brave. Of course, it's trying to run away, but when the coyote gets close to it, it actually jumps up and tries to bite at the coyote. Now, as we were watching these coyotes, my guests were asking me, why aren't the bison worried about these three predators roaming around their herd? They were within a hundred feet of these bison. And that's because coyotes typically don't hunt large prey. They typically hunt smaller rodents, insects, and will even eat things like berries and other plant matter. And so it really is a misnomer that uh, coyotes kill large prey. A single coyote even has trouble catching and killing a deer fawn. And in the winter, small rodents like voles, mice, and shrews that live under the snow and are active really form the base for a lot of our carnivores out here. So coyotes, red foxes, American martens, long-tailed weasels, all of these smaller carnivores that remain active during the winter really depend on these smaller rodents as prey. And uh, of course, we ourselves affect these small rodents. And so putting out pesticides really does affect the nutritional value and really the palatability of these small rodents and, their, and can therefore affect the carnivores that feed upon them. And so this was a really amazing sighting that we had in Grand Teton National Park. It's really funny. A lot of people think that when we first see coyotes, they think that they're wolves because they're so fluffy. And that's because coyotes in like California, Arizona, anywhere in the South don't grow the really thick coats that the coyotes in Grand Teton National Park grow. It's one of the most beautiful pelts out here that we do encounter. And so uh, I hope you guys really enjoy checking out these beautiful wild dogs Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning into Wildlife Wednesdays. This is Tyler Greenlee and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week. Sorry, I put myself on mute again, guys. I'm gonna just leave it off, I think. I've learned my lesson. But hopefully you got the gist. Some really great views from Laura and Tyler there of some of our local coyotes, particularly hunting that montane vole. So guys, if you're enjoying this week's episode, we certainly encourage you to like and share our broadcast. It's a way for us to keep doing it. Uh, and if you're enjoying it or you know somebody who might, go ahead and share that with them through Messenger or you can share to a group. We sure certainly would appreciate it. And we're so glad if you're joining us for the first time today. Okay, let's get back to Kirk and talk a little bit about one of the most amazing photos I've seen the guides take this year. Really, really interesting stuff about a great gray owl. Hey everybody, Kirk here. Uh, what we found on a recent snowshoeing trip was a really interesting track from a great gray owl. And it's not something that we typically see, uh, so I made a point to take a picture of it uh, what we see in the snow here is a hole where this great gray might have punched through the snow with long, powerful legs in search of maybe mice or voles. But you might be wondering, how does this owl know exactly where that rodent is if you can't see it? That rodent's inhabiting a, a, a space under the snow called the subnivian layer, where it stays just a little bit warmer and they're out of sight from the owls, but the owls have a special adaptation to find them. They've got a superpower in the fact that they can hear what's moving around under the snow at some frequencies their hearing is 10 times stronger than ours. Uh, the great grays in particular have a facial disc. They have this circular face with uh, stiff feathers along the outside to help direct sound to their ears. Kind of like when you cup your ears behind your head. Uh, but they've also got 
one ear up high and one ear down low, and that helps them triangulate exactly where that sound is coming from. So maybe from sitting up in a tree, they could wait and listen intently. And when they do hear something, they'll pinpoint it and they'll strike, extending those long legs through the snowpack and hopefully finding success. Uh, but in this photo, you can see that hole where they punch through. You can even see the facial disc imprinted on the snow. And I can see where maybe those wings were swooping as this owl took off. I'm not sure if this owl had any luck, but hopefully it did. Pretty cool stuff. Could you guys actually see the face in the snow? How crazy is that? I've definitely on very rare occasions seen where owls have landed and gone to go after prey, but I've never been able to see their face smushed into the snow. Really, really, really fascinating stuff. So did you enjoy this week's videos? Were they fun? We've got plenty more for you, including quite a bit about Santa's reindeer, but it is time, of course, for our trivia question of the week. It's my second favorite part of the program, right? All right, so the way this is gonna work is if you'd like to win a $10 gift card to our EcoTour Adventure store, all you're gonna have to do is answer the question, the trivia question of the week correctly in the comment section. And I think I've really got a tough one for you guys this week. All right. Our featured item of the store this week is our brand new Grizzly Bear French Press um, mugs and carafes. These things are so cool. They feature the art of local artist Nicole Gayton. I'm hoping Maddie will link to both these awesome French presses in the store and also to Nicole Gayton's website. Uh, you can get them in three different colors. Guys, we serve the French press coffee um, from Planetary Design who makes these on our trips and guests say it's some of the best coffee that they've ever had um, that comes from these and they're portable. They're gonna keep your coffee hot all day long when you're out on your snowy adventures or even if you live in Miami and just want to be able to transport some great French press. And they even come with a little cup to drink from as well. So if that looks like that's interesting to you or you want to see any of the original artwork, um, original uh, crafts, uh, Steel clothing, Mangelson prints, photographs, images of Grizzly Bear 399. Check all that out on our online web store. We created it to help fund our employees during um, the first outbreak of COVID and 100% of the proceeds of the store continue to go to our employees. If you enjoy this broadcast and you're having a good time watching it and you want to give a little something extra to some of the guides that you've seen today for bringing this video footage to you, um, you can also, of course, go ahead and tip us um you can just go right to the eco tour store and give us five bucks in return for bringing wildlife wednesday for you but that's totally optional we really enjoy spreading the love and spreading all the wildlife that we enjoy and conservation and stories and science messages about these animals every week all right guys pretty fun stuff our question of the week last week which is already or two weeks ago because we were in training last week um our question was uh, from two weeks ago, if you answer this in the comment section now, you will not have a chance to win. We've already given out that gift card. But if you know the answer, go ahead and put it in the comment section. And that, that question from two weeks ago was, what is the most numerous, most common large mammal in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem? So if you know the answer to that question, Go ahead and put it in the comment section. It won't get you the $10 gift card, but I'm just curious to see how many people know off the top of their head. We got a lot of answers to this one that were actually incorrect, which surprised me. There were quite a few people who said moose, um, which is one of the most least numerous large mammals in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, although we have more um, Alsace moose here than just about anywhere else in the world. We also got a lot of people who said deer, and it is a member of the deer family. A couple people said pronghorn, that's not correct. The answer is the elk. The elk is the most numerous large mammal in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. This footage came to us from Tyler. And uh, we have about oh, between 30 and 40,000 elk in the GYE. It's kind of hard to count them all, but um, there's two major herds 
And for the last decade, the Jackson Herd, which runs between Grand Teton National Park and the National Elk Refuge, um, is actually the larger of the two at about 11,000 in number. Um, but the Northern Range Herd historically has been the bigger of the two. Uh, both populations are currently growing. So if you ever hear from anybody, it's a common misconception that, you know, the wolves are killing all of the elk or the grizzlies are killing all of the elk or the mountain lions are killing all of the elk, you know, pick your predator. Um, that's not the case. Uh, generally speaking, the ecosystem is sustainable. There's a couple exceptions here and there where historically elk maybe didn't live and then lived after we expatriated predators. And now that predators have returned, those sort of blind valleys or things maybe aren't necessarily a good place for elk to be. But in general, elk populations are growing and growing quite rapidly and are quite numerous for both humans to consume and predators alike. So if you got that answer correct, give yourself uh, a tap on the shoulder in congratulations. But all right, this week's question, I thought, you know, Christmas is coming up. Let's go ahead and ask you a question about reindeer. Now, reindeer don't live here in Jackson Hole, but let's go ahead and see what you know about reindeer. They're um, the only member of the Rangerford genus of the deer family. So they're all by themselves off in their own little corner in the taxonomic world. And they live in the Arctic, but they're circumpolar, which means they're actually located um, actually all the way around the Arctic. So in North America, we call them caribou. And then, of course, in the Eastern Hemisphere, they're more commonly known as reindeer. There's a couple different kinds of them. Actually, I think there's, I'm trying to remember. I was reading about this today. There's like 23 different kinds of reindeer and, reindeer and caribou and that whole family um, and different sizes and what have you. The, the biggest type is uh, the, the boreal woodland caribou. And the smallest type is the salvabad uh reindeer but it's kind of nobody's really exactly sure um how big or small the type that is raised by mrs claus the magical reindeer that santa uses to deliver gifts to all the children of the world every year they're probably based on illustrations that we've seen over the years um somewhere in the middle of all of these different species in terms of size but my question for you um this week, and this is how you get your $10 gift card to EcoTour stores. Answer this in the comments section, which is uh, based on most depictions of them, what gender are all of Santa's reindeer? Are they male or female? So based on their depictions, is Rudolph a boy or a girl? So if you know the answer, go ahead and let me know in the comment section. We'll let you know if you are right next week. And uh, we will go ahead and Elise will pick one name randomly out of all the correct answers and let you know if you've won that gift card. Now, guys, I will tell you, if you are watching this and you're not on the Eco Tour Adventures page, you're on a different group perhaps, and you comment on that group page, that will not enter you to win. You actually have to go to the Eco Tour page, go to the comment section under this video and comment for your chance to win. I wanna give everybody a fair chance. So if you know if Santa's reindeer are male or female based on most common depictions of them, go ahead and let me know. Okay, bonus points if you can name all of the reindeer. Do you know them all? Go ahead and put it in the comment section if you know that too. No peeking at everybody else's comments. It's harder than you'd think. I was trying to think of them all today and I was singing the song and I couldn't quite get it. So awesome. See if you know the answer to that. That's pretty fun. Now, of course, it is time for my favorite part of the program, which is the question and answer. So if you've got a question for me that's biology or naturalist or reindeer related, definitely do ask me in the comment section and we'll go through them all one by one and we'll see if we can't get you guys some answers. All right, now I've got my iPad here. Uh, so if you see me looking down, that's because I'm looking at your comments as they come in live. So bear with me as I kind of scroll through and we'll see if we can't get you guys some answers. All righty. Lots of answers, lots of different answers for the trivia question. Let's see here. All 
All right. We had a lot of questions about some news from this week. Uh, quite a couple different people who were asking if the elk disease in the feeding ground at Jackson will infect the herd. Um, some, Jeanne also asks, uh, can anything be done to stop the spread of CWD on the elk refuge? Same question. So if you saw the news this week um, that CWD was detected in an elk um, in Jackson Hole, uh, you either were very dismayed by this news or you have absolutely no idea what I just said and that was gibberish. So um, CWD is a shortened name for chronic wasting disease. It's a prion type disorder. It's abnormally folded proteins that create a condition that is incurable and inevitably fatal. It is very closely related to, or perhaps the same thing as, a number of other diseases that work exactly the same way and use the same abnormally folded protein. These may sound more common to you. Mad cow disease in cattle, Crutzfield's Jacobson's disease in humans, scrappy in sheep, chronic wasting disease in the members of the deer family, including elk, moose, and deer, are all either exactly the same thing or they are very, very, very closely related to each other. The reason we are concerned about CWD is the same reason we're concerned about mad cow or Crutzfield's Jacobson's disease, which is it is transmissible between members certainly of the same species. We know in the case of CWD, it's absolutely transmissible between different members of the deer family. And there is concern and um, while we don't have firm evidence, suspicion that it is transferable between different species. In other words, it's a zoonotic disease. So, for instance, if you were to consume the flesh of a cow, um, particularly uh, nervous system tissue, spinal cord tissue, brain tissue of a cow who had mad cow disease, there is a chance that you could acquire that disease. And of course, if you were to consume the nervous system tissue of an animal with chronic wasting disease, there is... Um, while not proven a suspicion, you could certainly acquire that disease. So there's two problems here. The first, of course, is the risk to humans. Um, this disease is invariably fatal. It is progressive and it is uh, a pretty awful disease. It causes basically mass degeneration of the brain until death. Uh, but also there's a secondary concern, which of course is that's not good for the members of, of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. If elk are readily spreading it to each other and moose and deer, then it will basically, there's a lot of studies out there about what would happen, but the short version is we wouldn't have any old elk. So the problem with Jackson Hole is it's a little bit different. We've had CWD discovered um, in quite a bit of land east of Wyoming. It's definitely um, getting to near epidemic proportions in places like um, Colorado, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the like in, in white-tailed deer populations. And those animals tend to spread and space themselves out. But elk actually congregate on feed grounds and places like the National Elk Refuge because we do supplementally feed elk on the National Elk Refuge uh, to support them during the winter. And that's a controversial thing, but that's a story for another time in terms of there's um, there's reasons that we do that. There's reasons that it would be a bad idea to do that. There's reasons that it would be a good idea to do that. And there's a lot going on there. But the long story short is these animals are congregating much more densely than traditionally wildlife would. And the concern is something like CWD is going to have a much stronger effect on that population because they're not spreading themselves out. The other issue with CWD is once it exists in the soil, we've never found a way to get rid of it. Because prions are not alive, you can't kill them. And uh, once it's in the grass and in the soil, they've had situations, particularly where they've studied scrappy, where they've dug up the soil 40 feet down, put it in an incinerator and heated it to over 2000 degrees and it was still there. So once it's here, it's here. So the news that CWD was found um, here this week, uh, while disappointing, is not surprising. We've been waiting for this news for a long time. We had a moose in Star Valley, about 40 miles away from here, acquire the disease a couple years ago. We had some um, spotted sporadic cases for the last 10 years throughout um, eastern and central Wyoming. It's just been marching its way westward. What this means in the long term is still really unknown. Uh, there are studies that are very dramatic and uh, very concerning that say, you know, elk will die before the age of three and might reproduce once and then die of the disease. 
that's probably unlikely. There are other studies that say the effect will be minimal, um, and as long as you're very carefully testing elk if you plan to consume them, uh, that it wouldn't necessarily be the end of the world. Um, that's probably too simplistic and optimistic. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. I'm not here to inflict my opinions on you. I'm just saying there's a range of science and the best I can do is give you what I know and let you kind of generate your own opinion. There's lots, lots more information available about all of this. The Wyoming Game and Fish website does have a nice press release. Uh, they're going to go ahead and give more information as they know. But if you are somebody who um, consumes the flesh of elk of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, do know that there are several testing programs in place and that this elk was detected because of one of these testing programs. And I do encourage you to do two things. The first is um, if you do hunt elk to go ahead and please do donate some nervous tissue for testing, both for your own safety, but also so we can monitor the disease. That's very simple. You can either um, deposit a tooth or or you can go to one of these stations where they can go ahead and get a piece of um, brain or spinal tissue. And the second thing is, is if you see an elk acting very abnormally, spinning in circles, disoriented, drooling, um, unable to rise, do please inform um, the managers of the wildlands that you're in so that they can investigate further. Um, if we can um, do our best to mitigate the spread, uh, regardless of how severe and problematic this will be in the long term, we can certainly try to delay things as best we can. So hopefully that answers your questions. Lots going on with CWD. Uh, it's a pretty confusing topic. Certainly can go more into it maybe on some other stuff, but for those of you guys who don't want to hear on and on about it, and it's kind of a Debbie Downer on Christmas week, I won't go much more on it, but great question. I appreciate that. Kobe asks, is it true that wolf packs put the weakest in the front and the alphas in the back? This is another one that's kind of long and complicated. The short version is kind of. Um, I've seen the memes and the posts around the internet that show the pictures of the wolves walking. There's a couple different ones talking about how the alphas always stay in the back so that they can watch the family and take care of everybody and put the other ones in the front and Kind of. Uh, wolves are certainly capable of higher order cognitive thinking, which means they have very um, uh, complex emotional lives. And they're certainly capable of cognitive reasoning and caring for individuals and, and, and helping the whole. And, and they live these lives where the family is more important than the individual. And so this is very admirable in human culture. And it's something that we admire about wolves. But sometimes we can take these things that these traits we admire in wildlife and anthropomorphize them and maybe take them to a little bit more of an extreme than is the case. I will tell you in all of my years watching wolves um, that most often the alphas are either in the middle or they're towards the back. But that could be for the very simple reason that the pups and the youngsters, just like youngsters anywhere, young children, young horses, young anything else, always want to run ahead of the group, right? Um, the alphas in the back tend to be the elder members, sometimes the oldest members of the pack, and they have no reason to be running in the front of the group. But I will say um, that the strongest members of the pack are typically the ones to break trail when it's really snow and snowy and difficult out. That's not always the alphas. Um, but the alphas are always very careful to make sure no one's left behind in those conditions. So if the goal of the question was to um, sort of illustrate the care that wolves place with each other as a pack and as a family, and that the alphas do work hard to take care of the family, that's absolutely the case. As for are they always in the back? No, but I think they always are very aware uh, of where the different members of the pack are. And in particularly when it comes into hunting, um, different strategies call for the alphas to be in different locations. So typically the sprinters, uh, the fast females are gonna be all the way in the front and that might not necessarily be the alphas. And then the large burly males are gonna pull down prey in the back. They're gonna hold back, wait for the, the sprinters to kind of tire out the prey before they kind of come in. And I've seen alphas that are very big burly animals and I've seen alphas that actually aren't that big. And so that actually has more to do with where they are in hunting than based on their pack structure. So hopefully that answers the question. This is basically sort of 
but they definitely care about everybody in the group. Okay, awesome. Let's see here. Dawn says, are large raptors bothered by super cold temperatures? They can at very, very cold temperatures, but raptors and other birds are incredibly well built to handle cold temperatures. Uh, it's actually really nifty. They, they fluff out their feathers uh, and they kind of have two layers of feathers. They have this outer layer of guard feathers that are very, very, um, very dense and they're very thick and overlapping so that air doesn't go in underneath those feathers. And then they've got that downy layer underneath, which is what like a goose down comforter would be made from. And that area is very fluffy and diffuse and it allows them to poof up and then their body heat will warm a whole layer of air underneath those thick, dense feathers. It's a little bit like how a wetsuit works. So a wetsuit works um, when you jump into cold water there's that thick layer keeping more cold water from coming towards you, but the water that's surrounding your body is actually warmed by your skin, which helps to keep you warm. Uh, big raptors are doing exactly the same thing. There is a limit to this. When you get into the negative 40, negative 50 degree temps, you'll definitely see they're more willing to hunker down, sit on a branch, and just kind of stay put than they are gonna be flying around because opening up their wings is a great way to expel out all of that heat. So kind of hunkering in on a branch is a really, really good way to spend a day when it's really cold out. Owls are particularly good experts at this keeping warm thing, um, but waterfowl are probably the biggest winners at this. Something like a, a trumpeter swan or Canada goose is really an expert uh, at swimming in that cold water using the wetsuit reaction like we just discussed, and then while in the air, sort of fluffing out those feathers to stay warm. So they actually do pretty well and are very occasionally very cold temperatures here in Jackson Hole. So great question, thank you for that one. Let's see here. Oh, lots of correct reindeer. Oh man, you guys are good with your reindeer. That's pretty awesome. Sadie asks, what kind of training did you undergo last week? Great, great question. So we do winter training every year um, and has lots of components to it. Um, we are um, obviously all trained as naturalists. Some of us are trained as biologists. Some of us, are, some of us have a lot of different kinds of professional training. Some of us have um, professional certifications in cross-country skiing. Uh, we also have a professional cross-country skiing um, instructor and trainer come in and teach us how to be teachers. Uh, we also get training in snowshoeing and wildlife tracking and ethics and winter ecology and all of the things that we would hope to be able to share with you. And because we all come from different strong backgrounds, it's a great way for us to be able to share with each other. Our training was a little bit different this year than normal years because of course of COVID. Um, far, far more socially distanced outside. We definitely were trying to make sure um, that we were not getting anywhere near each other. So there was a lot of kind of loud talking in the snow. But if you guys saw the intro uh, this week of Wildlife Wednesday, that was a image of our ecotours biologist Verlin skiing down a slope there. That was on cross country skis, guys. That was not downhill skis because he's that good of a cross country skier. I will tell you that my attempts to ski such slopes uh, resulted in me falling pretty darn quickly. Uh, but we all had a really, really good time. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have some more video and images of that for you later because it's not very often that we all kind of get together as a group. Um, our next training probably won't take place um, as a big group until we feel like we're all vaccinated and we can be a little bit uh, more typical and kind of in more close density with each other. So hopefully that answers that question. Always a really fun time and I appreciate you guys letting us take a break uh, to make sure that we were all up and ready, running and ready to get you guys out to go see wildlife, take you cross-country skiing, take you snowshoeing all winter long. So great question. Let's see here. Maddie has a good comment about CWD. He says, I call the Grand Teton National Park rangers and biologists to do field tests on my elk harvest. 
Um, you got to make sure you're doing the dirty work of conservation. It's up to us to provide valuable science to maintain the health of this great elk herd. Well put, Maddie. Exactly correct. All right, perfect. I think I've got everybody's questions this week. Guys, it's been such a pleasure spending this Wednesday with you. Next Wednesday, I'm hoping we'll get together some video and maybe do like a look back of 2020. Would that be fun? Let me know in the comment section if you think that'd be a good idea. In the meantime, if you celebrate Christmas, I hope you have a very, very Merry Christmas. And I know some of us might not be um, able to be with our family and our friends and we're staying safe and we're staying socially distant, but know that we here in Jackson Hole are thinking about all of you, our Great Wildlife Wednesday followers. We really wish you the best of holiday greetings and joy, and uh, we'll see you all next week. So long! <laughs>